Wow, thanks everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Simon Pegg is one of the hilarious minds behind Shaun of the Dead, World's End, Paul, the last Star Trek film, and a number of other films and TV shows. In Ready Player One, he plays the business brain behind Oasis, a virtual reality world that has taken a dystopic future world by storm. Let's take a look. Come with me. This is the Oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do, but they stay because of all the things they can be. I'm here talking to all of you now because our future's being threatened. Go, go, go! I just came here to escape, but I found something much bigger than myself. I found my friends. I found love. And now, people have lost their lives. No, 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 no. This is war. We're in control of the future. Find him. Welcome to the rebellion, Wade. You don't tell anyone who you are. You can't use your real name. Hold on to something. This isn't just a game. I'm talking about actual life and death stuff. What's going on? The threat is in my Mario Kart! Come on! Ask yourself, are you willing to fight? Please welcome Simon Pegg. <laughs> Mr. Pegg, thanks so much for being here. It's very nice to be here, thank you very much. Congratulations on Ready Player One, man. A really, really awesome movie. Yeah, it's a trip, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's really great. You guys shot this in 2016, right? So it's about two years after having shot it that it's uh, yeah. released. Our job, uh, the, the, the job of principal photography, the live action stuff, and the stuff that was done in the performance capture space, was just the beginning. You know, obviously everything that followed was all the post-production to create the Oasis, and uh, that took a long time, so. I'm curious, did you see any cuts that were like sort of in the middle of the visual effects or anything like that? Or I it... didn't even see it when I did my ADR. You know, when you go back and you redo a little bit of dialogue here and there where they need to clean the sand up. Usually you do it to picture, but I didn't even see it then because really? it was under lock and key. So I just had to guess where my mouth was, what my mouth was doing. There's a lot of the time, to be honest, now I'm doing that. Uh, what was it like? I mean, what did you feel like when you got told that you got the part? You're going to be working with Steven Spielberg. Um, well, I, 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 he just called. I, I got a call. I, ironically, and I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I, I, I'd finished doing Star Trek Beyond. and that you Wrote? Which I wrote. And that was a very... I co-wrote with Doug Jung. It was a very um, intense experience and a beautiful one and one that I will always treasure uh, but it was difficult at first we had six months to write it from scratch and um, it was incredibly uh, intensive work um, it was a lot of fun in the end the shoot was great I was very 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 pleased with the film that came off the back of Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and that came off the back of The Force Awakens which I did a little bit in but also um, was present on and I kind of after Star Trek just thought oh, I just don't want to give up now I think I've done it all. <laughs> I was like, I don't know what I want to do now. I've done all my childhood dreams come true. Time to take a break at the very least. I might go thing? fix a boat or something. Do you know what I mean? I, I might go and um, change careers completely. And I said to my agent in, 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 in no uncertain terms, I'm going to take six months off. Don't call me unless Spielberg rings. <laughs> And then three months later, <laughs> he did. And um, I got a call saying, Stephen's going to ring you, which he always does. He's an incredibly sort of hands-on filmmaker. And, um, and I, I, I was out to dinner with a couple of my Star Trek friends and had to do that thing where I, the phone rang and I went, I got to take this. 
it's Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> I went to dinner with him knowing he was going to call, by the way. I just Wait, when you, say at dinner with, <laughs> when you say at dinner with Star Trek friends, do you mean people that you made the movie Star Trek with, or do you mean, like, friends who like Star Trek with you? <laughs> <laughs> no, with, with a couple of the cast of Star Trek. Okay. Uh, although I do also have Star Trek friends as well. Trekkies at dinner together. <laughs> um, all, all, my, all Trekkies are Star Trek friends. Um, no, and then and then I, I, he sort of explained the situation and what he wanted to do and who who he wanted me to play. And I'd read the book and and um, so I was um, and also he, when he calls, you just answer, you know. Yeah, I can't imagine anybody is like ah, I don't know. Sorry, yeah. I don't. You don't screen Steven Spielberg. Do you know what I mean? You pick up and you say the word yes, then you hang up. Right. <laughs> hand, hand the phone to your friend to be like, say you're my assistant. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, I know. I want to seem like a big shot for him. I'm too excited to speak to him. You know, I still get very, um, as a fan of his growing up and, and as a filmmaker and a film fan, you know, he, he shaped a lot of my tastes and, and my attitudes towards film, pure entertainment and sort of, you know, loftier ideals in terms of film. You know, I get very excited when he walks into the room still and, um, and, and unabashedly hug him. <laughs> Do you um, sort of do you uh, do you try to pull stories out of him all the time when you're around him? Do you, you try to like? You don't need to try. It's like, and he's not Mr. Raconteur. I, I talk about myself all the time. He's very humble, but the fact is, his life is just a series of amazing stories, ironically. And um, so, f for between setups and stuff, you might just go, "Oh, Jaws, what was that like?" And he'll tell you, you know. And um, and I, I love hearing stories about, you know, he talks about making Jaws as being obviously an arduous task, and, but something he was doing so he could make his flying saucer film, which was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And it's great to sort of, you know, he was 26 then, and to hear stories about what was going on. and was Yeah, and directing the likes of Robert Shaw and, you know, Roy Schneider, it's just incredible. That's right, because he was like a teenager when he started kind of directing TV show. Like he had yeah. his little gig directing sort of our like Alfred Hitchcock presents or something and like I th that. Yeah, he directed Joan Crawford when he was twenty, you know, and so um, he is a plethora, a walking plethora of incredible stories, and he's very happy to talk about it. Now you you you've written a number of films, in, including co-writing Star Trek Beyond. Uh, forgive me for not knowing this off the top of my head. Have you directed really yet? Do not you want yet. to direct? I did a tiny bit of second unit on Shaun of the Dead, uh, directing some zombies, which wasn't difficult. Um, it was just like, and moan. Um, but do you enjoy I, directing? Do you want to I do, do I am directing at the end of this year. I have a project which I've got set up and um, will hopefully direct... I start prep for that in, in late summer. So uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to, to do that. Yeah. So was your time spent with Spielberg just kind of like watching how <laughs> he did the, did the show? Yeah, I mean, the thing about him is that he is, it's, it's an effortless ability that he has. It's, a, it's, it's fundamentalized by passion, and, um, but there's also this sort of innate understanding of how the camera communicates uh, and also how to communicate his own ideas to us as actors you know he's he's brilliant one on one you see that very clearly in the in the volume which is where we do the performance capture because there are no cameras there it's just uh, that gets directed later on you you capture the image you capture the sequence in the computer later he can look at the sequence and direct it and shoot it from different ways you, he owns that 3d event it's kind of hard to explain but I think I got it. Well, it's like a room with like 360 degree yeah, cameras yeah. all around, and then he and can once swoop in, he can zoom. Yeah, he whatever can, he wants. Yeah. Once we've done it, you know, once we've got a take that he likes, he can shoot that take from any angle, however many times he wants. So, um, but what I love, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but no, no. I do want to say one of the things that I do love about Ready Player One is seeing him sort of embrace that technology and embrace directing that way, but juxtaposing that with someone who still loves making movies the old fashioned way. Absolutely. Because all of the scenes that involve just the actors that are in the stacks or, yeah, that are in the stacks or in the sort of dystopic world are still directed in a somewhat beautiful old fashioned way. Yeah, it's interesting that he had, uh, he had to sort of meet in the middle as well. He found a, a moment when uh, uh, Ty Sheridan's character is looking at old sort of archival footage of myself and Mark Rylance's characters uh, having a conversation in the past. And Stephen really wanted him to be able to kind of t turn it round and move it like you would on a tablet. And so he went away at the weekend and came up with this idea to shoot the scene with an ellipse of live action cameras so that he could then stitch all the images together and then literally revolve it, you know? And he had that idea over the weekend. <laughs> he kind of went away on Friday, like, well, how am I going to do this? And then Monday was like, okay, 
And it's kind of awe-inspiring to, to behold. So that's like one of those things where if you're going to be going into directing your own movie, it could be a curse or a blessing to sort of watch him direct, <laughs> you know, because it, it's true. I mean, you could be like, oh, I could just show up and kind of figure it out on the spot like that. And it's like, no, yeah. he's operating on maybe a higher plane. Absolutely. <laughs> and also with the, uh, such a wealth of experience as well. I mean, you know, what's great about watching him work is is there's never any any sort of... Um, everything's very lean in terms of the way he moves the camera. It's very economical. He's trying to tell a story. He's not trying to be fancy. We spoke a little bit before the show about um, his motivated camera work. That's it, It's like mathematics to him. You know, he kind of figures out exactly how to tell a, a story in a single shot to take in a variety of incidents without having to come round on it or specify on anything. He's very got, few, very few directors who can do that. Yeah, who can, it's like him, Scorsese, and De Palma kind of does it sometimes or used to do it. Yeah, and new directors sometimes. I guess like maybe Paul Thomas Anderson does it pretty well now. JJ does it, and I, that's I, true. Yeah, I know that because um, we were doing a shot in Star Trek. Uh, into Darkness, and I remember it was quite a long shot, and I said, oh, that's really cool, you've done that and that, and he went, yeah, I got that from Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and who better to, to take your inspirations from? But there's a lot of directors who try to do a sort of long shot, who are like, oh, look at how long my shot is, and where yeah. we're going, but then there's the directors who know how to sort of jam-pack a long shot with information, so you can sort of forget that you're even watching a director yeah. show off. and there has to be a point to that shot. It's not just about, oh, look, that was all done in one shot, isn't that clever? That's hollow as an artistic sort of expression, but if that if that long shot actually tells a story and each each moment that it takes in actually builds the narrative, then that's that's done properly. You can be showy as a director; it's easy to move the camera around these days on all sorts of crazy apparatus and look like you're being kinetic. And but if it's not motivated by ideas or point, then it's you know it's pointless. Is there a part of you as a director that wants to be kind of showy when you when you get the chance, whip the camera around and, <laughs> and do some do some steady cams? I don't think so. The film I'm directing is a sort of character piece. I don't think it's going to involve much. Having just done Mission Impossible Fallout, which which required some of the most bizarre, <laughs> ingenious camera movements and, and rigs I've ever seen, um, I'm glad I'm not making a film like that. Can we talk a little bit about what your film is, or do you is it? Do you not want to? I can't. I guess I can't really talk about it yet. I'd like to. It's uh, it's it's a, it's a small kind of drama, really. And Did we, you write we, it? No, uh, it was written by a guy um, uh, who used to be a doctor. I'm going to be really enigmatic, and um, and that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, a doctor! Wow, great, great. <laughs> but the film has nothing to do with doctoring. David Cronenberg was a uh, doctor at one point, or at least a medical student. So it it could, maybe it's David a body Cron horror. Movie. I'm writing David. I'm directing David Cronenberg's new film. You heard it here first. <laughs> Dead Ringers <laughs> Two. Uh, talk a, a little bit. You you mentioned Mission Impossible Fallout. I've seen some of the clips of uh, TC driving a helicopter mm. around a cliff. Yeah. Is there are those? Is that like some of the rigs that you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, we shot some really mad stuff. That that was in um, New Zealand, and we shot. A lot of stuff in New Zealand, and then myself and Rebecca Ferguson and Ving Rames, we all went home because the last week was to be spent with Tom doing all his aerial stunts. And um, we knew it was dangerous, what was happening, and it was really weird when we all said goodbye because it was like, all right then. <laughs> I guess I'll see you in London, maybe. Um, Good luck. <laughs> and it, there was some really awkward hugs and like, he might die, you know. And then the irony was that he, he, he did it all and then came back to London and broke his foot. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, jumping over between two buildings, you know. So, so he did all this in insane... He flew these helicopters himself, did things that, you know, experienced pilots would, would hesitate to do, and then um, fell over and broke his foot. <laughs> when, you, when you get told that you guys are making the next Mission Impossible, is the first question just kind of like, what is Tom doing now? It's like, what are we he, throwing him into? How is he going to die this time? Uh, yeah, because the, the, the film, what happened was we did Ghost Protocol, and he did that amazing stunt on the Burj Khalifa. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the audience really responded to it because it's real, and the way Brad Bird shot it was so vertiginous. You know, people really got a kick out of it, and the film did really well, and I think it was because it was an authentic... Uh, you know, actor versus elements thing. Was that the one where he's climbing the... <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Me. yeah. And so that became the idea for selling the movie. It was like, okay, the stunts are real. So the next time he's hanging off a plane, and then this time he's d falling out of helicopters and flying helicopters. And I just worry about Mission Impossible 10, right. because what the hell is he going to do then? <laughs> other than, you know, perish. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Wait, so you said that you had uh, you had read Ready Player One prior. I imagine with your background and your passions that you probably really uh, loved the book. Yeah. Um, if it hadn't been Spielberg, would you have been a little more worried about anybody else directing the film? I don't know. I mean, it was a, it's it's an interesting one because it felt to me like the culmination of of what culture has become. This book and this film as well. It's it's sort of this is the you know the the is apotheosis is that the right word of the sort of um, of, of reference culture of postmodernism. This is the ultimate postmodern film, you know, and um, and the book is very similar to that. I, I would have been interested in it, um, whoever was directing it, because it's a it's a an interesting idea and one I think that's slightly less. A lot a lot has been made of the references in the movie, but but the the references are really by the by, you know the. The, the, the world that James Halliday has created, the reason it is so heavily referential is because he can't escape his own past. And he, he doesn't want to leave his own youth because that's where he feels comfortable. He has, you know, the character is essentially aspergic. He's, he, he can't function socially, so he creates a universe where he feels comfortable, and that is in the past. And that's kind of a reflection of what we're doing today in terms of how we are recycling and rebooting and, and dragging things from our own childhoods into that. And I say our own childhoods. I mean, people in their sort of 30s and 40s, the gatekeepers of popular culture at the moment, not the YouTubers and stuff who are the real sort of inheritors of the earth. I mean, the old... They're doing whatever they want. <laughs> yeah, I have absolutely. no idea what they're doing. They are YouTube. rocking it. Yeah. And my daughter just loves them. You know, I took Tilly onto set, Mission Impossible, Star Trek, Star Wars. She's like, whatever. Miranda Sings comes on the TV. She's like, I want to meet her. <laughs> you know? like, this guy's flying a helicopter alone. <laughs> She's like, this person's just yelling at me through the through their home computer. Tom Cruise like, is trying great. to talk to her, like tapping her on the shoulder, and she's on her phone going, get lost, will you? I don't want to talk to you. I'm watching, you know, Dan TDM. Um, I can't remember what I was saying. No, but it, it, it does feel to me like that, that this, is, um, this is about being careful about nostalgia and about not being too rooted in things that have gone before, about leaving our comfort zones, you know, because when James Halliday gets to the end of his life, he realizes that he didn't ever make any real human connections. Did you ever worry about the world that you created with um, Edgar and, and, and Nick in, in terms of being postmodern and being sort of stuck in, in I don't want to say stuck because I don't think you guys were, but both those, you know, those three films, that trilogy of films are very referential oh, absolutely. To, to, you know, Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz and yeah. World's End. Well, they were our kind of, you know, our, our, our sort of um, expressions of our own sort of likes and passions as we grew up and... But we use those to try and say something about the present. You know, Shaun of the Dead perhaps was about big city living and how, how, how much you can ignore people around you, even if they're dying and trying to eat you. And Hot Fuzz was kind of our, our love letter to action movies that we'd grown up, but seeing it through the prism of a, a very colloquial British setting. And, you know, The World's End is another film about nostalgia, the dangers of clinging to the past, and about the, the terrors of addiction and what it can force you to do, you know. So... Yeah, had the greatest use of a Sisters of Mercy song than I think any movie has <laughs> actually done. Like I was so happy that that song. That was, used. was my absolute joy. They were my, you know, I love the Sisters of Mercy. I was great workout song. Total goth when I was growing up. And were so you they, really? Oh yeah, my God, absolutely. And so the what I wear in the World's End was kind of a version of what I wore when I was eighteen, nineteen. And uh, probably how I behaved as well. What were your goth groups when you were young? Sisters of Mercy. Sisters who else? of Mercy, Bauhaus, yeah. uh, The Cure, obviously, um, uh, Fields of the Nephilim, The Mission, uh, Balaam and the Angel, The March Violets. Yeah, we're going. I can go deep if you want. <laughs> you named like three that I don't know, so that yeah, yeah that blew me away. Yeah. yeah, that was my. That's my. That was. They were my jams back then. Did you ever so you you know you make these three these three films this trilogy of films that are a commentary on being stuck in the past while at mm. the same time embracing the past in a lot of ways did you ever worry that the that audiences didn't get them in the same way that maybe audiences won't get Ready Player One on some level, like they're too stuck in the past and the references to get the actual kind of cautionary tale about it. No, because I think the main the main body of the stuff that you know what was important the messages the narrative were existed. Uh, despite the subtext, you know, the, a lot of the stuff in Shaun of the Dead, um, the little references that we made to other horror movies, they're a bonus. You know, if you don't see Landis, the, the shop, or you don't see, you know, some of the, the street names or whatever that are named after horror directors, um, you know, it doesn't matter. Because what we were trying to do was use uh, a known genre of film to say something about 
collectivism and you know city living. The same with with Hot Fuzz. Hot Fuzz functions perfectly well as a as a funny action film if you don't get the various little nods to to what's good, to its forebears. We have to acknowledge our forebears because we're not trying to be original in that sense. You know, we made a kind of George Romero movie. We took George's mythology and we we used it for our own ends, but we always wanted people to know that we were doing that. George came up with that whole idea of of the zombie that is that the cannibalistic biting zombie is that's it's not like an old myth. And it's so weird that like there's all these other sort of stories or shows and movies that don't clearly reference it I know, in some way. It, it kind of and I'm glad that like you've got someone like Greg Nicotero who works on The Walking Dead who worked with George and does his best to put little bits and pieces into The Walking Dead. But The Walking Dead is someone else's idea, you know, just done in a different way. Yeah. And and it's not like an old myth that's taken from Norse kind of folklore. You know, th it was 1968 that that zombie was born and it was George thinking, well, cannibals are kind of in and, and um, let's make zombies like vampires. So if they bite you, then you get the... And so th that's going back to the fact that we wanted the, the world to know that we love George Romero, you know, and in the same way that with Hot Fuzz, we wanted the world to know that we absolutely accepted the works of, you know, um, Catherine Bigelow and Michael Bay. Uh, enjoyed them even, particularly Catherine Bigelow. Point Break is such a great film. Point Break actually has one of the most beautiful uh, shots, I think, of any action movie when Keanu Reeves first enters the FBI office. Yes. It's this incredible tracking shot or steady cam through the office. It's like a Spielberg, it's just sort and of he's motivation. All, he's it's all incredible. wet, isn't he? Because he's been outside shooting things and he looks so gorgeous. It's ridiculous. He gets, he gets a, I think he gets a donut in it as yeah. well. Yeah. And what a great. Donut. What a great <laughs> film as well, in terms of like, I think it kind of slipped through the net as a, as a, a film about machismo directed by a woman, you know, and as such seen through a, given a certain objectivity, which makes it far more, far smarter and far re more relevant than I think a lot of people give it credit for being, you know. It's a great, great, great film. Yeah. Very critical of, of, of Machismo as well, without, yeah. without sort of being um, heavy handed about it. Yeah, critical yeah. of it, accepting of it in a way yeah. and pitying it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, you know, you said that you wrote, uh, and I guess maybe you already told this story, so I apologize, I haven't heard it, but uh, you wrote Star Trek Beyond in six months, you had six months to write it. Yeah. What was that, what made you want to do that, and, you know, what was that process like? I How did you get through that process? I didn't really want to do it as such. It kind of came in, there, there was a script, and um, it got... You know, they decided not to go with it, but at a very late date, but they still wanted to keep our release date because of the 50th anniversary being in 2016. Um, and it just came down to, you know, JJ and Lindsay Webber at Bad Robots sort of saying, do you want to do this? And it felt like someone giving me the keys to the most amazing vehicle in ever and me going, no thanks. I mean, I felt like saying no thanks would be ridiculous. I want to drive this thing. Sure, I might crash it into the wall and die horribly, but... <laughs> I can't say no. So um, fortunately, I think we, you know, we only dented it in a minor way. Um, I enjoyed Beyond. I thought no, I lie. I'm, I, I'm very happy with Beyond, and I think what Doug and I did was was to approach it uh, like a big episode of the show, to yeah. try and structurally build it like an episode of the original series, and and have it be a, a single adventure, um, and explore some of the interesting relationships that within the the Star Trek uh, crew um, that maybe haven't been. Um, explored before. We felt like Spock and Kirk had been a little played out and the other two, so let's put him with Bones and have that fantastic dynamic play out a little more, you know, um, clearly. Uh, it was hard work. Justin Lin is a fantastic guy, and um, but at first I didn't know what he wanted and Doug didn't know what he wanted. He Justin sort of is a, is a visual communicator. It's hard to sort of like, when he tells you what he wants, you're like, huh? Uh, <laughs> But, and so we all had to learn each other's processes, and, and that was at times maddening. And there were people banging on the door saying, how many spaceships do we need to build? What, where, what does this planet look like? How many aliens are in that room? And you're like, I don't know. I don't know what I have for breakfast. What are you asking me that for? You know. Um, but when we finally got onto the shoot, and we had a rough, pretty much a, you know, a, a shooting script loosely described as. Were you writing on the set as well? Uh, every day, every day. <laughs> because we'd look at the schedule and go, okay, we got this scene and this scene tomorrow. Let's stay up till midnight and make sure it's absolutely right. I remember oh, texting Chris know, like, Pine really... at like three o'clock in the morning going, no, Kirk will say this. Don't say that, say this. <laughs> so you were, I mean, it's not like you were like absolutely reshuffling things, you were just polishing more. It was all about polishing. We had this, sh we had this shape and the structure and the events, but it was about finessing the dialogue the character interactions, 
the kind of the motivations, all that stuff. We, that was just like a daily, every single day of the shoot we wrote. Well, what I imagine is so hard for a writer. I mean, even if it wasn't, even if it was pretty polished going into the shoot, if you're looking at the script and you wrote that two weeks ago, emotionally, you <laughs> might be like, well, I can just kind of cut this and move this around a well, little we, bit. Well, sometimes we do that on the day. Like we'd, we'd get the scene on its feet and we'd rehearse it and, the, uh, the cast are so talented. They throw stuff in. We'd be like, "Yeah, that's a great idea," and we'd, you know, we'd chop and change it. And uh, it was it was fun. I mean, by the time we got to that stage, it it, it was actually really really enjoyable, but um, it's stressful at times. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from our audience right here. Hi, Simon. Hey, man. Hey, um, you mentioned the trilogy and working with um, Edgar and Nick. Yeah, just want to touch upon that. I remember watching a TV show called Spaced. Yes. Back in England on Channel 4. I can tell by your accent. Okay. I don't know why I only ran for two seasons. That, that, that's beyond me. But that, I think that was the first time that um, you collaborated with Nick, um, Edgar, and I'm going to mention Jessica Stevenson as well. Yes. She, she wrote it. So the question I have is, was it a difficult transition from writing a TV show to making a movie with uh, you kind of writing with Jessica and um, Edgar directing, was it? Yes, cool? it was. Yeah, um, and um, well, the, the, firstly, the reason we only made two seasons was because after the second season, we were so tired. Um, it was such a difficult show to make. Edgar and me thought, well, let's do something different and write a film. And then everything changed, you know, after that. Uh, and the timing to get the third season together never quite worked out. One thing we realized when we sat down to write Shaun of the Dead, that it wasn't going to be like writing three episodes of a sitcom and sticking them all together. It's a different animal. You know, it, there's a structural um, template that you can abide by. Not all filmmakers do or have to, but the three-act structure when you're using, when you're making genre films is generally pretty reliable. And so we went back to school and we read Robert McKee and Sid Field and we drew diagrams and we had a flip chart and we kind of structured our film out um, in such a way that we were able to create a piece of cinema as opposed to a piece of television because they were very different and less different nowadays actually, but uh, certainly in terms of short form, you know, 90 minute entertainment or whatever, um, it, was a, it was a case of relearning our technique. What did you do to your foot? Um, I'm a runner, so... Okay, good. Talk that was my question to you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hey, Sam. Hey, striding uh, down with this one, coming yeah. straight up to the front. <laughs> uh, I, I love your movies, and, uh, and I got to see this uh, movie too early, and it, it was so much fun. Uh, I was wondering if you, uh, if you had an avatar in the Oasis, uh, what character would you want to be playing yourself? I don't know. I think um, I like the idea of looking very different. You know, there's a um, there's a, a a sort of price you pay when you when you do this job and you become a bit visible, and then you, sometimes it's difficult to to be function in society without people wanting to have a picture with you or whatever. You know, it's, and that people are always very nice and sweet, but sometimes you just want to go to the shop and and not worry about things. So I would definitely have a different face, um, probably wider shoulders, slightly taller. Um, um, I'd look more like Ty Sheridan than me, because <laughs> he's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question. Is this our last question, or do we have m two more? This right here. Hi. Um, Hi. First off, uh, thank you for being part of uh, well, um, one of the best anthro anthology trilogies ever made, to an extent where it inspired me to become a screenwriter as well. Uh, and one of my favorite assi well, assignments I had to do for one of my classes was uh, a script analysis, so I decided to do The World's End. Okay. Um, like very last minute, as in three in the morning, typing as I'm watching the film. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so my uh, question uh, to you is, uh, since the majority of your career uh, from writing and acting, um, you've been in so many different genres, blockbusters, and doing different homages to yeah. classic cinema, are there any other uh, genres you want to pl uh, play around with or you feel like you've done them all? I don't know. I, I think we always approached it from the, you, you know, before the genre came the sort of kernel of the human story. And then, and then it wasn't like, oh, let's do sci-fi next. You know, we had this, the, I, the reason we came up with the, the, the science fiction angle for The World's End was because we wanted to do a story about um, going back to your hometown when you haven't been there for 20 years and, and it feeling weird and it feeling like you don't know, like everyone's changed. And for us, it was just the natural progression that would be, oh, that's because everybody's a robot now, you know? And um, 
Then you go back to kind of like Stepford Wives or something. Yeah, like yeah. That, I mean, yeah. a lot of sort of social science fiction, less movie references really in The World's End, more sort of John Wyndham and uh, novelists like that. But um, I don't know. I, I, I was a big fan of genre cinema growing up. You know, I'm a Star Wars kid and, you know, became a Star Trek teenager and, you know, Spielberg was my bread and butter growing up. So it's been fun to participate in that. But I'd love to work with other filmmakers, you know, the Coen brothers and Paul Thomas Anderson, people who are filmmakers who don't necessarily work within genre, but are fantastic at creating film. So, um, yeah, I think I think it's less about genre now for me, more about just diversity of, of filmmaker and, and, and the ideas. I think I might do more serious stuff now. I might start exercising my dramatic chops. <laughs> Is there a filmmaker? I mean, I think because of um, the the, ref the references in the in the trilogy of films, and because of Star Trek, people are associate you and your sensibility probably only with sci-fi or genre films. Yeah. Are there filmmakers that you love or that you grew up with that are not within that compartment? Yeah. Well, the uh, Raising Arizona is one of my all-time favorite movies, and I love the Coens sort of. The, the breadth of their um, subject matter and tone and themes is just staggering. You know, they'll go from making a essentially a Looney Tunes movie, you know, which is Raising Arizona, to doing something incredibly, you know, studious and dark or, or serious. Or um, and I, for me, Raising Arizona was a film that that showed me how comedy, and for Edgar as well, I know because we bonded on this film, how uh, the the funny in a film doesn't just have to be the script or the people in it. The funny can also come from the how the camera moves, how the script is structured, how things are set up and paid off, what work you have to do as an audience member to put the pieces together. And I think that film is a masterclass in, um, in that kind of filmmaking. So yeah, I've always really admired the Coen brothers as a, uh, a filmmaking team. And so very much Barry Sonnenfeld in that film. As yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. His yeah. camera work as DP. Yeah. Because yeah. then you see like what he did with Men in the first Men in Black. Yeah, and the yeah. Adams Family. It's very much you can you can see the similarities there. I know that the the Coens and Sam Raimi were uh, sort of um, contemporaries and were having a a, a sort of. Um, I, I hesitate to say uh, it's a peeing contest. Can I say that about camera Pers moves? Pissing contest. Uh, and if you watch the Evil Dead, there is uh, is in Raising Arizona. There's a great scene where the camera goes along the floor and it goes up over the car and then down and up a ladder and into the house. And Raimi answered that by the camera going over the floor, through the back window of the car, out of the front window of the car, and then into the, the cabin. And that was them having their little who can do the craziest camera work competition. Was Raimi set, fo followed that? So Evil yes. Dead 2 Evil Dead followed. 2 followed Raising Arizona. Yeah. Right, right, right. God, that's great. Uh, one more question. Uh, hello. Hello. It's nice to meet you. Um, so I know you said uh, earlier that you've done a lot of different films that you've wanted to do like and work with Spielberg. I'm just wondering what you're passionate about uh, outside of film. Um, none. <laughs> uh, no, I, about f my family, you know, about my real life um, for me is very important. Um, I, I have a, a young daughter who I dote on and who, who I have extraordinary fun hanging out with and, you know, playing video games and uh, yes, watching movies. I have forced her to watch a variety of um, films that she might not have known if she, you know, I mean, talk, I'm talking about my childhood films, you know, I've put her through those. How does it feel? This is, a, I'm not a parent yet, but I've worried about the time when I become a parent and I'm like, watch this movie that I love. And they're like, I don't give a shit about this movie <laughs> like, what, 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 have you had that instance yet? No, I, I mean, it's interesting that, like, she's not, Star Wars doesn't really impact on her like it did on me because it doesn't, it doesn't have the same social weight that it had when I was a kid or, there weren't films like that when I was a kid, so it was a genuine surprise. Now lots of films are, are that spectacular and big. Yeah. You know, her favorite film is Titanic, and, uh, and this is her second favorite film, which is a high praise indeed. Um, but yeah, because she just loves the Jack and Rose thing. You know, she's eight years old, and, and I think she, the, 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 the sort of childish drama of Titanic, the very basic story of Titanic, which is at once the most infuriating and brilliant film you'll watch. You know, it is, it is equal parts God awful and bloody wonderful, yeah. you know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't fucks with Titanic. It's a great no, movie. no. I mean, I, I respect all the decisions in it. I love the way all the British people are just horrible, because <laughs> <laughs> everyone who's British is, I say you shouldn't do that. My goodness. Uh, 
I, I don't, I don't uh, resent that kind of racism at all. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I accept it. I'm sure uh, 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 we, we earned it in, in many ways. Um, but yeah, that's, that's her kind of thing. But I have sat her down to watch certain films um, trepidatiously, but love the fact that she's, you know, she really liked The Incredible Shrinking Man, you know, like an old black and white movie or The Creature from the Black Lagoon. You know, she loved Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, but she prefers Bogus Journey, which is a bone of contention in our house, but there you go. I am on the same page with <laughs> really? her about that. Because she loves death. She loves that character. I also you think... think I my battleship. I was too young when I saw Excellent Adventure to really get it. Right. And then when I saw Bogus Journey, I really got it. And I went back to Excellent Adventure, but Bogus Journey was already kind of like in my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also the Kiss song in Bogus Journey is so bad. Oh, yeah, it's at the end. It's just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> God gave rock and roll, roll to yes, you. yes, yes, yes. Um, so, but occasionally I'll say, oh, why don't we watch such and such? And still, no, I want to watch somebody unboxing a toy on YouTube. And I, so I watched that with her. But I did take her through, very interesting, Spielberg related. I took her through the Indiana Jones stories. Uh, Raiders first, and um, which was amazing because it's quite violent. When you watch it again, there's melting Nazis, and you know, which is the only thing Nazis should do, really. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and and people being speared and killed. And when the when the Nazis were melting at the end, she literally went, "Oh, Dad, this is horrible. I don't like it. Can I watch it again?" Um, <laughs> And then she watched Temple of Doom, which is quite a grumpy film. You know, there's a lot of, it's a bit misogynistic and very racist, but still enjoyable, you know, I mean, in a, in a way that we go, oh, okay. Um, Last Crusade, I think, was her favorite because of the father-son interplay. But watching The Crystal Skull with her, which is, you know, a contentious film because I think all the, all the older Indiana Jones fans were a little bit like, mm. I enjoyed it more watching it with her because she got it on a far simpler level and it was much more entertaining to watch it with her because you I wasn't didn't have going, the baggage. Yes, I wasn't yeah. going, no, like that. You know, I, I was just going, hey, yeah, this is pretty good, you know. You so, hashtagging it in the, <laughs> in the midst of what, oh, God. I haven't shown her any of the Star Wars prequels um, because if she liked those, we'd fall out. Uh, well, she's eight, right? She's <laughs> she probably would like them. And she's you know what? I love Jar Jar Binks. She's eight years old. <laughs> she knows he exists because I gave our dog a toy of him once. Uh, and we, we watched it chew him to pieces. Um, to be a fly on the wall while she's laughing hysterically at Jar Jar, and you're just, oh. <laughs> You're no daughter of mine. Um, but no, you know what, if, if she watches them and enjoys them, that's perfectly fine. And I, I, as again, I, I had all the baggage, you know, and I look back on that now and how outspoken I was about my disdain for that. And I feel a little embarrassed by it, you know, because it's just a film, you know. And I know these things mean something to all of us in some respects, but ultimately, yeah. <laughs> It's you can quote about, me on like, that. An extremely film, nostalgic film. <laughs> yeah, movies. right. Uh, Simon, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank the you, movie Ricky, uh, Ready Player One, the fantastic, awesome Ready Player One, opens today, right? This yeah, weekend. Yeah, now, it's, go it's, see it. Yeah, go see it. See it more than once, and I, I, sneak in if you have to. I, I hate to sort of sound like a corporate stooge that you have to pay to see the film more than once, but it, it certainly requires multiple viewings because you can watch the story and then you can watch the visuals and then you can just pick all the crazy stuff that's going on in the background. Um, so you use the Titanic tagline for it. See it again for the first time. Yes, yes. there you go. Ready player it all one. comes back to Titanic, you see. <laughs> Simon Beck, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.